Hello friends, I'm Brenda Crouch. I believe the winds of global change compel us to the mysteries that speak to path and purpose. In a time of amplified chaos, there is a divine compass to navigate the conditions that drive our everyday decisions. For the next 30 minutes, we'll explore stories and the knowledge of sojourners who will point the way to the secrets that lie before us. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Hello, friends. I'm so glad you've joined me today. And what I want to talk to you about is what is really could be perceived as the current unraveling of the church or the church systems all around us. We're seeing things on the news that are disturbing, and I can think of no better person than my guest today to speak into this very issue. His name is Dr. Mark Sharona, and his life and ministry of over 40 years is dedicated to helping people learn how to flourish and how to become lifelong learners. He is a theosemiotician holding a doctorate of ministry in future studies as well as an MA in psychology. He is an author, an international speaker, and you've seen him on many global platforms and television networks. But more importantly, he is my friend and he is my mentor. And I am so personally honored to have you here with us today, Dr. Sharona. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate you beyond words. Um, The honor is mine, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, many people won't know this, and I don't even know if you realize that I did the math last night, and it was 14 years ago that I was sitting in a a very dark cocoon. I'd been pulverized by trauma, many years of trauma compiled, and then uh, had experienced a recent trauma in my life that absolutely leveled me. I was at a place where my faith had been shaken, my, um, my family was broken, and I had no church, I had no community, and it was the Spirit of, Lord, of the Lord, I believe, that led me to find you and discover you on uh, TBN. It was on uh, Christian media platforms, Daystar, and I began to listen. There was something in the things you were saying that were compelling me, that were grabbing me and saying, there is something that wants to happen in your life, but there are areas that you've got to awaken. And so you were a compelling force in my life to really, you were that voice, prophetic voice in the wilderness, so to speak, that called to me in my slumber, in my brokenness. And I had no clue at that time that all these years later, we would become such dear friends and you would be uh, still an amazing force in my life. But truly someone that has had the gift of being able to see into other people and recognize what is there. You see the treasure in the soil. And I don't want to take up all your time, but I wanted to kind of set that foundation for why I so respect you and love you as my brother in the Lord. And it it helps me to really uh, feel a compassion for where people are right now as church systems are shaking and they are crumbling. And uh, we're seeing things in the news. We're seeing ministries exposed and uh, corruption that's taken place. We see it all over. I mean, in politics, but in the world of religion, we have these expectations and we just don't think that these things should happen or could happen to the institutions that have fed us and that have been our 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 safe place, our our synagogue, our you know our sanctuary. Can you speak into uh, this issue and where how people might be able to stop and process? What's happening, and where is God in the middle of all this? Yeah, it's a great question, Brenda. Um, y- you know, I, I think first and foremost, we we need to locate ourselves in terms of where we are in history. Mm-hmm. There, um, nothing happens in a vacuum. Nothing happens um, isolated from anything else. Um, everything moves in what historians would call the arc of history. So. Many of the trajectories of things that began both decades ago as well as centuries ago will converge in cycles at certain points. And we are at one of those periods in history where a number of cycles are converging. Um, 
And those are socioeconomic, those are sociopolitical, uh, there are also ethnic cycles, there are, are mm. also cycles in relationship to um, climate. Um, and you put all of that together and then you add a wild card and everything is up for grabs. And the wild card mm. obviously is the COVID um, mm. that has pressed a, I don't even know if I want to call it a reset button because in, in, in terms of future studies, which as you know, is what I got my first doctorate in, um, we look at the fact that there are possible futures, plausible futures, probable futures, preferable futures, and then this one thing out here that doesn't come with a P, and it's <laughs> called what we don't plan on called the wild card or what wow. the black swan. Um, back yeah. in, um, in the 17th century, there was a Dutch explorer from Europe who was sailing the west coast of Australia, and in Europe, there are only white swans, and there's never been a black swan in Europe. No one's, so nobody believed that black swans existed, and this Dutch explorer goes to, goes to, the, to, to where, where there's, a, there's a place called the Swan Sea um, on the west side of Australia, and lo and behold, he sees a black swan. And it's a game changer because now all of a sudden in, in Europe for all these centuries, well, there's no, there's no such thing as a black swan. Well, now you see one and that throws your world off. So a, a black swan is an event that is a radical game changer and is totally disruptive. Now, um, Nassim Talib, who talks about the black swan, will claim that uh, COVID is not a black swan. I tend to disagree with him. Um, I do think it's a wild card event. I think it has radically I think is it is it is as radically disoriented and maybe more so than 9-11. And what happens with one of those kinds of events is with everything else that's going on, that happens. And now with everything that brings, the, the psyche gets into a place of upheaval. Mm -hmm. So put all of that together and now you've got people coping with everything else that's going on, plus this disease, this virus. And people have lost loved ones mm. people, and, and the virus doesn't have any sort of a predictable guarantee that, you know, one person can get it and have no symptoms. Another person can get it can almost die. Some people can die and they're perfectly right. healthy. Um, it's really, it's wild. <clears throat> there's, there's no way to describe it. And then on top of that, with all this, all the requirements to try to curb its, its spread, um, Sadly, it got politicized and created more confusion. And now we've got all these divisions. And then on top of that, people that are not used to being isolated, whatever those unfinished business issues are, they all come to the surface. And so mm -hmm. you've got this, this sea change, a massive sea change. And so psychologically, emotionally, relationally, everything is up for grabs. And yeah. um, even if the um, the virus were to settle down, let's say by the spring of this next year, um, the fact is this virus is with us to stay. These things don't go anywhere. Covid's they're all this is COVID nineteen. I mean, we, we you know there's 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 plenty more, and and this thing can mutate. But let's just say this particular season settles down the human mind is going to take another three years to settle down wow and collectively people are still processing their sense of safety now yeah. put on top of that the unrest globally put on top of that the rank division that has been created even within our own culture and the vitriol and the hatred, and then put that in, into the bag with, there's a lot of issues in the church that need to be addressed. Right. And now all of a sudden we're looking at, well, well, you know, uh, can, can, can God, can we like take an eraser and just make this all go away and start yeah. again? Because this is, this is, this is mm -hmm. utterly painful and people are battling mm -hmm. grief. They're battling anxiety. Yeah. Um, there's abuse of authority. There is an awareness that, um, you know, that, that um, 
grace is now something that gives us an excuse to do whatever we want to do. Um, the cross is no longer something that's really essential. Let's not talk about all of that. Let's just talk about have a happy life. And, mm. you know, well, I mean, who, who's happy right now? I mean, yeah. who's happy right now? Let's, let's be real. Let's get out of this bubble. Right. And start telling yeah. the truth about where we are. Yeah. Well, clearly it's a very complex issue and one that uh, deserves a lot more than a half an hour of programming. So I realize I've asked you a very loaded question, but, you know, where do we start? Uh, what I think that we're we're having to not just redefine for ourselves, but we're really needing to get to that place where we're willing to stop and be present in the moment, pay attention to the all the emotions you just mentioned, all of the um, the issues and the division and the the, the chaos that's all around us. Uh, is this a wake up call? And if so, what are we being called to awaken to? That's a great question as well. I think. Um God is always doing something, whether we're doing it with him or not, whether we're paying attention is something else. But obviously, there is a sense in which everything that can be shaken in our generation is being shaken. Yeah. So our response to all of that becomes crucial. And the only appropriate response for a child of God is to submit to the dealings of the Holy Spirit, first and foremost, in their own personal life, because the kingdom of God is in Christ Jesus. The kingdom is in eating or drinking. Um, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the government of Christ has to work its way through our hearts. So mm -hmm. it is whether or not we are personally yielded to what Jesus is calling us to as servants of the kingdom. And, you know, the most um, basic understanding, and it's deep, it's not just basic of the kingdom, is the Sermon on the Mount. Um, mm -hmm. What Jesus calls us to is a life, and, and ironically, Brenda, I'm hearing popular preachers tell us that the Sermon on the Mount is the Old Testament, and that is just absolute mm -hmm. ignorance. It is absolutely theologically unfaithful, and um, when I hear preachers say that the Gospels are part of the Old Covenant, I want to say, first and foremost, you guys need to go to if whatever Bible school you went to, they need to take away your Bible. <laughs> and you certainly don't deserve to be in the pulpit leading people because what you're doing is lying to them. Mm -hmm. And this is bald faced lies and heretical even. But we're not even allowed to talk about that anymore because we just want everybody to be happy. Well, uh, Jesus didn't die to make us happy. Jesus died to make us partakers of the divine nature. And there's a world of difference. And I and not that Amen. God want us happy, but but the cross shaped life. Uh, is not something that's, you know, if you want to hear three easy steps to get your blessing uh, rather than take up your cross and follow me, you got to ask, which one yeah. is Jesus saying? You know, which yeah. one is Jesus? Yeah, so. exactly. And, uh, you know, but there is a reward for taking up our cross and oh. following him. And uh, you've experienced it. I've experienced it. And I would not trade one ounce of the things that I've suffered because they led me to the person of Christ. And I was raised being taught about Jesus and feeling that I was being, you know, the good representation, the good ambassador of Christ. And yet I had no clue. And that's why I say, I feel compelled in this time, in this era to be able to share from my own experiences because that is what brought me to him. So is there the positive side to this where those who will listen might, you know, we have an opportunity and those who might listen, what can they experience from their stale uh, Sunday school religion that they've been eating for so many years? Uh, I, I kind of liken it to where when Jesus was resurrected and his own disciples weren't recognizing him, <laughs> you know, they'd walked with this man, heard his voice. They didn't recognize him. And, uh, it, you know, he had to, he had to begin to, um, uh, show uh, that he was the Christ through through the signs and the wonders. But uh, back to back to this question, what is the positive side and how can we discover him anew and afresh in our pain, in our grief, in our confusion without losing, we don't have to lose our faith and walk away because we're hurting. What yeah. should we be doing right now? 
Yeah, so I'm going to make a statement that may be controversial, but I'm going to make it anyway. We okay. need to start reading the Bible and start reading the scripture because there's two different yeah. things. I think we have become committed to reading the Bible as the, the word Bible simply means book, and we don't read it as the scriptures. And to read it mm -hmm. as the scriptures requires that we understand when Jesus is on the road to Emmaus, it's his uncle Cleopas and his aunt Mary that don't recognize him, let alone the rest of them that don't either. But it's his uncle and his aunt. I mean, they, he grew up around them, but they don't recognize him. And the reason is, is because they were, he said, you're slow of heart to believe all that the scriptures have said. Mm. We can only know Christ by the wow. scripture. But what they were reading, they were, they were reading into what they wanted this, the Bible mm. to say instead. And you cannot to read it as scripture is to see Christ from Genesis to Malachi for Cleopas and Mary. Mm. And now we've got the New Testament as well, but if we cannot understand that when Jesus in his own hometown is handed the scroll of Isaiah and he opens the book, it says, or opens the scroll, that's a major key. Mm. In other words, until he opens the book, we haven't got a clue what it means. So whatever they thought, Isaiah 61 meant for all those 700 years since Isaiah prophesied it until Jesus opens it and says, this is about me. Whatever interpretation they had was wrong. Because mm. it's him. And so whatever we do with scripture, because Jesus said all of the law and all the prophets is about me. And the moment we make anything in from Genesis to Malachi about something other than Jesus, we are not only are not discerning Christ in the scripture, we're turning the Bible into what we want it to say and making it say, and we're, and Paul read the same scripture that Peter did, except Paul as Saul used that to create unrest, hatred, and he committed violence and murder against Christians in the name of God. But he wasn't mm -hmm. reading scripture as scripture. He was reading mm -hmm. it as the letter of the law. And it was, yes. it, you know, so, and so we can, I cannot know Christ in my personal context until I know him in the scripture, until I can discern him by the spirit wow. in the scripture, I will not discern mm -hmm. him in my life. No matter what, wow. it, no matter how many goosebumps I get, no matter how many angelic visitations I get, unless I faithfully know him from the text, I will mess up however I interpret what I'm going through in my life. Wow. You just said a load right there. That, that answers a lot as to where we are. There's so many people with so many platforms, so many voices trying to represent the gospel and who Christ is. And yet there's not, um, there, there's no, I, I don't always discern the Holy Spirit in it. And uh, it's, you know, a lot of people are chasing after signs and wonders they're not, as you said, studying who is the person of the Christ and how am I encountering him in my life? Yeah. And so, so the signs and wonders uh, is, is another. Listen, I am all for um, I believe in the in the power and the presence of the spirit and his charismatic expressions. I have been graced by God to see God move in awesome ways, miraculous ways. Um, but what we have unfortunately cultivated in a consumer driven mm -hmm. Walmart yeah. culture is this idea that signs and wonders are the big, they're the big sideshow, nothing else right. matters. And a sign <clears throat> is a sign because it points to something. Yeah. And when I turn the sign into the thing, I've already misinterpreted wow. the sign. That's so good. That's so good. And, and I really hope that our viewers are listening to this today. You talk about, in the last few minutes that we have, you talk about the person of Jesus who comes to us from our future. Listen, I relate to that because that's exactly what he's done for me. And as I see the convergence of how my life has unfolded since that time that he met me in my dark cocoon, tell us about how he comes to us from our future and visits us in our present. Okay, so when we think about the nature of God, um, at best, our human language is still limited. Mm -hmm. But we're told in scripture that Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so he's both of those at the same time. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, is that 
Jesus is the Omega who is calling us from the future to the future. But he's also, because he's calling us from the future to the future, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, even though he is not slain historically until the fullness of time. So mm. now we're dealing with something in theology called metaphysics. And so the, the resurrection is the biggest game changer in the universe because uh, Robert W. Jensen, the late Lutheran theologian, said nothing happens to God. God happens to everything. And that the incarnation doesn't merely happen in time. It happens to time. Mm. So now when we get here, you say, well, Doc, this is deep. My problem is, is that we have got <laughs> we're in the we've been in the shallow end of the pool for so long that if we were to turn the clock yeah. back to before the the enlightenment period, this would have been common dialogue amongst the saints for centuries. Um, this would have been understood in a catechism class 500 years ago with kids that were studying about who Jesus is. We have become totally illiterate in terms of the scripture. And what's happening now is mm -hmm. that we now have a mental health crisis. Yeah. We don't, we don't just have an epidemic with, with a COVID-19. We've got a mental health crisis. And people are throwing Bible verses around claiming mm -hmm. this verse will do it for you, but misreading the scripture and pulling a text out of context and don't know what the story of Jesus is all about and why the incarnation is so important. Mm -hmm. and why? Because of that, we can say he's calling us from the future to the future. You think that's part of our shaking right now? Uh, I think I think it's a large part of the shaking. And I think the, and the shaking in Haggai, too, is the voice of the Lord. It's mm -hmm. the voice of God that's shaking. It's not Russia. It's not politics. It's not China. That's not it's not the virus. What's shaking everything is the voice of the Lord. My voice shall yet again shake. And the challenge yeah. is that the place from which the voice is supposed to be shaking is a church in some ways that has lost its moorings. Mm. And so judgment has wow. to begin in the house of God. And I, I don't think we're judging ourselves. And w at better we judge ourselves than God judge us. But right. I fear we're coming to a place where there's going to come a day of reckoning for the church and we're not prepared mm. for it. Mm. How do we heal what, uh, where we are? How do we heal our, our division? How do we get back to uh, the truth and, uh, and, and find what it means to be faithful again? Okay, well, I think first and foremost, and, and, and these are just, these are thoughts, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom yeah. and, 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 and of understanding. So I, I think we need to recover a sense of what, is, what does it mean to have a reverential awe for the mm -hmm. God who is totally other, other than we are. He is, the concept of holiness is not just set apart. It's total otherwiseness. God is not like us. He is totally other than us. And so for Isaiah, revival isn't when the roof blows off. It's when the bottom falls out of everything that has nothing to do with what God is doing. Mm -hmm. Revival doesn't happen for Isaiah until he has a vision of the one who is enthroned in the glory, and he says, woe is me. For the first five chapters of Isaiah, he's pronouncing everybody else. Wow. But when he wow. says, woe is me, that's when he really understands what he's called to. And then, wow. and for the disciples, the nine at the bottom of the mountain of transfiguration um, couldn't cast out the, the, the demon out of the boy that was tormented from the time he was a child. And so when they get mm -hmm. back to the house, why couldn't we do it? And that's mm -hmm. where the Bible begins, when we can't do it and wow. we learn some more from Jesus. So it's so when the here bottom, we are. <laughs> where the bottom falls out. So I think God is yeah. priming us for renewal. And, yeah, amen. And, and I think we are at a place very similar to the era when St. Francis in the 12th century was told by God, repair my church. And he mm -hmm. thought it was the little chapel in San Damiano. Uh, in Italy, when God was actually saying, no, I want, I want to start a renewal movement. I'm going to do it through you. That's where we are. Wow. We're, wow. We're, we're at another position like that. So what feels often like uh, or to many people po possibly as God's uh, punishment or uh, judgment or whatever is really his mercy. It's his grace. Oh, correct? yeah. God doesn't that judge us like we do. God, God's judgment is not like ours. It's our uh, salvation. 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so when you hear a lot of these angry preachers saying God's going to kill these people, and I say, which God do you serve? Because the God I serve doesn't kill people. He says, right. Father, forgive them. He heals them. He delivers them. He's the triune God of love and grace. Mm -hmm. And so I get really concerned when I hear Christians advocating violence. It's deeply, mm -hmm. That just shows you how far we've come from where the gospel yeah. would be. Absolutely. Uh, so many things to really take in today and to think about, because I, I know that as I began to listen to a lot of this, I, I, I was shaken and I felt like, wow, uh, you know, so many things I've been conditioned to either believe or to filter my beliefs through, um, it, it caused me to feel very insecure and, and, uh, to, to shake inside and internal, I just vibrated. And this caused me to really seek the Lord. And I'm just so grateful for your voice because we need your voice today. And I want to be one Avenue that can spread the word about, uh, your ministry and what you're doing to help people to heal and to come to a place of accountability and, uh, responsibility as, as believers to learn and to grow. I, I want you to just, uh, there's a very simple scripture, but I, I want you to take and, and just define this for us because the idea of faith has been, uh, it's been, been defined by many and, and kind of abused in that way. It's been abandoned. It's been mocked by culture. And Hebrews 11 tells us without faith, it is impossible to please God, but because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We talked about that today. Would you just take that scripture and maybe minister to that person who's just going, I don't even know what to believe right now. Yeah. So at the very simplest level, faith is childlike trust in a God who is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. I have faith because God is faithful. God has made a commitment to me called a covenant and he has made that a sure covenant because he gave us his best. He gave us his all. He gave us his only begotten son. And it is in that giving that he says, trust me, because I really am your ally. I am your lover. I am your strength. I am mm. your shield. And I don't derive any pleasure from the relationship if you don't trust me. So mm -hmm. pleasing God isn't a matter of brownie points. Yeah, good. It's a matter of God created us for his good pleasure. And so yeah. if there is no pleasure in the relationship, mm -hmm. it implies mm -hmm. we are either relating to him as a taskmaster, we're relating to him as this one who's out to get us, or we're trusting as a child in the hands of a benevolent, caring parent mm. that he is up to something good. Wow. He truly is. And, you know, even where we uh, may have grown stale, waxed cold, our love waxed cold, um, and we, we don't feel that same excitement that we might have when we first met the person of Christ. Uh, I want to encourage our viewers that he is there always pursuing you. He is always present and he is home. And all the things the enemy wants to pull you away to believe, those negative narratives, the things that he would rather you try to fix yourself, Jesus is there to complete you, to make you whole. You don't have to perform for his love and you are enough for him. Without him, none of us are enough. And uh, I want to thank you, my dear friend, for taking the time to be with me today, for encouraging me in my life and on my journey, and for encouraging so many people. There are so many who have uh, drank from the living waters of your deep wellspring of life. And so please go find Dr. Mark Sharona and follow him, follow his ministries and subscribe to him. How can they find you? Uh, MarkSharona.com, M-A-R-K-C-H-I-R-O-N-N-A.com. They can find me on Twitter at Mark Sharona. They can find me on Facebook at Dr. Mark Sharona. Um, pretty easy. As long as they spell the name right, it's pretty easy. <laughs> well, you're a deep well and you challenge us, but uh, you've always done it in love. 
and compassion and honor. So thank you for that. And I hope that we can do this again sometime. This has been fun for me. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank you, my friends, for joining us. I hope you will return again next time. I'm Brenda Crouch. 